and look at their legislators. So we're, uh, we're blessed today to have two lawmakers with us, and we're going to kind of test this out and see how they fare on our scorecard. So, uh, if you want to mind, and this is like, if you were curious, you can put in your zip code to find your lawmaker. But if you want to mind, let's put in uh, Matt B. Matt B. Why don't you raise your hand real quick? So let's see what you get in our legislative scorecard. So here you go. We get uh, 100%. I don't know if you guys can see that. When you click on that, there he is in that too. Uh, you get to see he's at 100 in the House of Representatives in Massachusetts at 25%. So the average is 25 of our views that they score, and Matt's at 100%, which is amazing. If you scroll down, <laughs> if you scroll down so this is for people here to look at. When you scroll down on Matt's profile, you get to see how he votes on these issues that we care about, and our stance from our fiscal line is the same. So one of the reasons why we launched this website is because it's really hard for anyone in this room to go to a legislative website and find lawmakers and how they vote. So say if you own an industry, say Brad Weicker owns this building, and there's a piece of legislation that says all buildings that are on you know, grass and street that's over five stories is going to have to uh, have a new tax. Well, Brad would say, oh crap, I need, to, I need to go find a piece of legislation and put my hearing. You'd probably have to hire a high power attorney just to track it. And that's not acceptable. So if you look at this website, this will give you how people actually vote. So just scroll down and put it mind. And this isn't really right wing stuff. This is this is pretty modern, actually, in Massachusetts. If you, if you just go up a little bit, that's okay. We, 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 uh, we score uh, votes on fiscal issues, so economic issues. How about 24 hours to review bills uh, before they vote on it? That's, that's not really right wing. Uh, that's kind of common sense. Uh, let's have so these guys can actually read something before they vote. It's not their fault. They're thrown in, in, the, in the legislature and they have to vote on bills before they read it. Uh, so this is something that we said we believe in it. These guys should be able to read what they want to vote on beforehand. The legislature is 29, if you've seen on the right, 29 voted yes in favor of this. That's our position. 125 lawmakers said no, I don't believe in that. They rather just you know go there and be told what to vote on. And, and so when you scroll down, you get to see every lawmaker and how they voted in their average score, the little elephant and uh, donkey for the party representation. So this is this is not us um, scoring people on what they say, you know, on the campaign trail, who they endorse, or what bills they propose. This is strictly scoring them on how they vote as a lawmaker. Uh, so it's not really biased. I mean, we have our position, but you know, this is how they actually do vote. Um, so why don't you uh, scroll back up and just hit the math fiscal scorecard or whatever. Let's get back to the home page. Not very quick. Home page. There you go. Let's look up Lombardo. Thank you. 
was one of them. The four Republicans at the time, four Democrats, before he was one of the Democrats. So this is a little pamphlet here, and this is kind of a teaser to our website. It shows every lawmaker in every store. It's kind of a great way for you to just figure out when you hear a lawmaker talk and kind of figure out how they actually score. You know, how, you know, kind of just get right to the point of are they actually conservative? Um, I will say this: we don't score on issues like guns. We don't score on issues like um, the social stuff out there. We just stick to kind of the, the taxes and spending, the budget process, and some transparency issues. So I just wanted to kind of bring this to light to you guys. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Okay, well, let's go through each person and then take questions all at once. So that okay? Yes. Okay. That's fine. Hi everyone. Hi Mark. Hi Mark. I'm Mark Lombardo. I'm a state rep from the town of Bowerica. It's the 22nd Middlesex district, and uh, it is just the town of Bowerica. Prior to being in the legislature in my second term, third year, I was on the board of selectmen uh, in Bowerica for six years. Uh, I served a term as uh, over a year as chairman, a couple years as vice chairman. Was the youngest elected selectman in the uh, town work of history, which was uh, quite surprising since the town's been around since 1655. So that was a nice little honor to have. Uh, and, I, and I tell you that because I think it points out what conservative, fiscal conservatives, Republicans need to do to try to take back the state legislature. And that's build strong farm teams, get them involved in local government, and then grow and bring them up to the state level. And, uh, and so that's my story. And uh, I'm also very honored to have my colleague Matt Beaton here with us today. That's it, that's all I have. All right, uh, I am Matt Beaton. I am the state representative of the 11th Worcester District, which is Shrewsbury and the precincts of Westboro. Uh, I didn't have much of a background in uh, you know, local government like Mark. Uh, I was a town meeting member. I was really active in my community, but I didn't really run for office. And uh, what really motivated me uh, I think you'll, you'll, when you get up into the uh, state house and you, you meet a lot of our, our colleagues, it's a lot of different walks of life. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of us doing a lot of different things. And the thing that ultimately motivated me was uh, trying to start and run my own business in Massachusetts. And being a uh, uh, owner of some rental property at an early age, and seeing uh, some of the abuses of a lot of programs and systems that we had by people. And, um, and, and also being inside an industry that got completely overtaken and changed by uh, new government programs, state-run, statewide programs, that completely changed the landscape of an industry that we needed uh, for many years. And it was uh, very frustrating, and ultimately what uh, was the spark for me to, to, to want to get involved, despite the things like uh, all the things that the, the guys over at the Fiscal Call and every uh, one over at the Mass Fiscal Alliance uh, bring light to. And uh, that is an incredible tool, and I encourage you all to spread the word to show people because uh, they've laid it out really easy. I mean, they couldn't have made it much more easy to find the information. They laid it out in a very simple manner. So I, I definitely encourage you to help spread the word on that. And uh, one of the topics I think we're going to talk about, um, you know, my background, I, uh, I went to school at WPI and then over at DU, I had kind of an environmental background. You know, I'm a Republican with an environmental background. Now they don't see that every day. But, uh, <laughs> But I, uh, as part of my company, I, uh, you know, we built uh, sustainable buildings, and we do it in such a way. My wife and I built the first sort of my Catholic house in Massachusetts, and we've gone through the last two key cycles without heating them. And the reason why I say that is, when we built it, because the town we live in, we couldn't qualify, we couldn't qualify for a lot of subsidies and all these other things. We built this house that does not need any heat, and we did it without a single tax credit, subsidy, or anything of the like, government intervention. And we were still able to do it in such a way that had a smart return on the investment. So a lot of these programs, and this is where I channeled a lot of my energy in the environmental world, all these subsidized programs, all these things you read about, and, uh, you know, solar this and wind that and all this stuff, that's, I've been trying to dig in uh, to the regulatory side of all that and try to bring light to a lot of the ways that we're, we're doing it. And you wouldn't believe the way of the bureaucracy and the nonsense that's been created since we've done a lot of these programs. So that's just some of the things that Mark and I are up here. And really quickly, one of the things that Mark and I really kind of led the charge in early on, uh, we both filed amendments to repeal that tech tax, that egregious tax. And uh, Mark comes from that industry. And, uh, you know, we really got up there and with our Republican colleagues, while at the time we were only 
30 out of 160. I think in our time, because Mark and I came in at the same time, it's probably the best example of how even though we're only 30, we can be loud and we can actually make a difference. And I think we're going to uh, hear more about the tech tax in a minute. But that shed light on how, even though we're few, how much we can do and how much, uh, how much more of a benefit we would have by having more of our colleagues. So when you're out there working for candidates and trying to get candidates elected, just remember this one magic number, 54. If we can get 54 Republicans in the legislature and have a Republican in the corner office, the entire dynamic of what goes on in the Massachusetts legislature will completely change because at that point we'll be able to sustain the government's veto. <laughs> These are the things we really got to be working for. Understanding that we all, you know, we don't agree with each other 100% of the time. We don't, but when it comes time, for things like the tech tax, we're ready to roll our sleeves up together, work together, and fight this nonsense that goes on up on Beacon Hill. So that's my two cents. Thank you all very much. And uh, so I'm going to shift to the specific format for this, but uh, we can dive into the tech tax a little bit. So, so my background um, outside of the state house is uh, in software. Uh, I, I sell software for a cloud-based company based out of uh, California, uh, one of the fastest-growing tech companies in the entire world. And I'm intimately familiar with the, the tech industry and the software industry. And when I saw that this, this software tax was being proposed, tech tax, I, I mean, it was like flashing lights, like this is a problem. And um, I took to the floor. And uh, the prior thing was, well, I called the Ways and Means uh, Chairman. And I asked him if he could explain how this tech tax would be applied. And I went through various areas of, of the software industry. There's implementation, there's you know, configuration of software, um, there's consulting services. And it, there's a whole array of, of areas within the industry. And the guys that supposedly wrote the bill had no idea what it did. They had no idea what it did. And they expected the legislature to pass something that they couldn't explain to us. Uh, and it was very evident to me, having been someone in the industry that has some expertise in this, that when the chairman of Ways and Means got up and the proponents of the tech tax got up and they tried to explain it, they had no idea what they're talking about. And that's why it's very important to, to imagine that we have people with all sorts of expertise that come into the state house in different industries. And you know, I'm not an expert on, on building and trade, and that's where you know Matt would really be able to throw in some expertise. But this was my area of expertise. And when you know what you're talking about, and you see someone go to the mic, and they may be able to convince some others that don't know what you're talking about that they should go a certain way. But when you know what you're talking about, it was just it was very clear. They didn't have a clue. And they're still not approved today, by the way. And what was more disturbing about that is they wanted to pass this bill and then throw it over to the Department of Revenue to decide, all right, we give you a framework, now we'll figure out how to make it work. Now you're talking about a dangerous way to put in legislation and let the Department of Revenue determine how much it was going to tax everybody. And it was such a mess for the Department of Revenue that they had to come out with, with guidelines and then other versions of guidelines and then revise those guidelines and revise them again. It was a complete Mess. One of the great things that we did during this, this debate, and Matt was the first one to do it, is when he, when he got up to the microphone, he looked out in the chamber and said, you know, we have a chamber of 160 people, of uh, 160 representatives, and I think there's like 40 in this chamber right now. There's no one's here for the debate. Nobody cares. And that's the problem with Beacon Hill. Because when you go into Beacon Hill and you look up the two boards, the voting boards, the very top corner, left corner, it says, Speaker. And there's a red light and a green light. And you know how everyone, in all the, particularly the Democrats, know how they vote? They sit and they wait. They look up, <coughs> they see how the speaker votes, and then they push their button. Right? That's how it works in Beacon Hill, folks. And that, that's why we need some change. Right? That's why we need change. That's why we need more balance in Beacon Hill. So that when we speak, that we can, we can have an audience that, that's listening, that cares about the debate, that everything is prearranged. And then we can have greater influence and actually change some of these votes. Uh, and the tech tax was, was uh, a great example of all those terrible things in motion. But it also brought up a, another great uh, thing, another example of how we can make a difference as Mexicans. 
Russia has got to point it out. Is the tech industry got so upset and so involved immediately after and told the, the Democratic leaders of the state that we're going to move our business. You are destroying our industry. We, we're a technology company. We don't have to have an office in Massachusetts. We'll go to New Hampshire. We'll go to Connecticut. We'll go to New York. We'll go to, to Florida. We don't need to be here. And for once, the Democrats were so alarmed at the outcry and the involvement of the tech industry. And they backed it. And it was a great example of how when people get involved and they really push and really work, they can stop that legislation. It would have been great if we had stopped it before it passed. <coughs> After the fact, to appeal, that's pretty good. So, so Matt was really instrumental in that. Uh, I'd like to think I played a, a, a part in that. Um, this, was, this was something I knew about. Um, it, just, it just outlines all of these lessons. Yeah. To that point, um, I don't care what party you're in, it's Democrat, Republican, Independent, whatever. Our government is not designed to be what, uh, 80, uh, 81 percent, or like 85 percent uh, on, on, on the house side, uh, one party, you have that same party up the corner office, and 90, 10 in the Senate, or whatever the numbers are. We are completely out of balance, and what that does is it stifles the debate. It, it's like Mark said, when we got up to take the floor to, uh, to raise taxes, $500 million, there were 45 people in the room out of 100. 30 Republicans, by the way. 30, 30 <laughs> Republicans. Every single Republican was in the room. Yeah. Yes, sir. It was like, uh, it's, the casino uh, looks like that people in Massachusetts do not want a casino. And do you think uh, there are two funny casinos? You know, we could have three casinos, plus two for the uh, race. Well, that's how it was designed. It's not looking like it's going to play out that way anymore. <laughs> no, they don't want. Right.
he wrote, but somebody in that office is the one that wrote it. Right. So they're putting their name on something that a, a, a civil servant or a political uh, appointment right. is putting in. Well, it's a problem of making hell, right? So a lot of times the leadership... Nobody's stressing it. Right. Leadership, uh, the majority party has these huge staff, and they hire all experts, and, uh, whether it be in health care or... Um, life sciences or any industry, I mean, if they have their staff and they depend heavily on the staff. I mean, if you, you bring out a great point that here uh, some of the political leaders are going forward with legislation that they don't even understand, right? Yeah. You'd be hard pressed to get anyone to admit that, but that was the reality of it. They didn't truly know what the legislation that what they were doing. And again, it goes back to Matt's point. When you have a legislation that is 85% um, in one party in the House or 90% and in the, in the Another uh, the Senate, and every single constitutional office is one party. But the reality is, is three people decide everything that goes on: the Speaker of the House, the Senate President, and the Governor, and they follow suit. That's an interesting fact. We're looking at these administrators. So it, to your point, on it, specifically on the tech tax, as part of the vehicle in the transportation finance bill, the Governor originally had it in his budget. We created, and when I say we, we as a body, the, the House created a, a, a new vehicle in the transportation finance bill. So this bill was supposed. To Supposedly supposed to go towards uh, transportation. What the tech sector <coughs> has to do with transportation, I still don't understand. But uh, if you read the bill, it's like section 48 and 49 of the transportation finance bill uh, that has to do with tech tax. It was literally five sentences long. Is yeah. that it? It was the most vague. It, you know, it, it talked about uh, integration, software development, uh, all, all these terms. It was so vaguely worded. Guys like Mark and I looked at this and literally laughed because the whole pitch coming out of Ways and Means was that this was going to be $160 million of new revenue for the Commonwealth. And our immediate reaction was we have no idea what the industry is and what actual specific things these industries are doing is actually going to be taxed with this tax. We're going to leave that up to DOR to promulgate regulations to figure out, we're going to have non-elected bureaucrats figure out what companies are going to be taxed. And despite us not having any clue what that would end up looking like, we were still somehow able to come up with a $150 million number. So to us, that was, that was one of the most uh, egregious parts of this tax. We're going to say, this is going to generate $150 million, but we actually don't have any idea who's going to be affected by it yet, or, or you know, how, how many companies are actually going to be affected by it. So, these are the things we're up against up there. Can we just take it back on what Matt and Mark are saying? As an observer of what they do in the state house, they were able to apply a lot of pressure to the body, which was wonderful. Um, they will experience very few days in their professional career where they get to go to the state house and repeal a tax. So that was something that was probably the first time they were done, and hopefully not the last time, but it was very significant for them to go in that building and vote to repeal taxes in Massachusetts. But to follow my point, the reason why they got to this point where they proposed this tax to pass and affect a lot of people is because there wasn't one public hearing on the tax bill. So you have a, a government making a new tax on a huge industry in Massachusetts without asking one person in the state what do you feel about it. And that is really problematic. So it's despite the, the argument saying, you know, you voted for the tax increase and then you voted to repeal it, you know, why did you do that? I don't really want to focus the people uh, to go that direction. I want to say the, the the system that got us here is broken and still is broken. And you can pass major tax bills without a single public hearing, and that has not been fixed since that happened. That's a problem. So despite this tax repeal being uh, put into effect and the you know, the software tax is done, there's nothing to prevent the House and the Senate from doing this again. And that really needs to be changed. So these guys deserve a lot of credit for being there and applying the pressure for months and months and months and be able to go their careers to repeal the tax, but there needs to be more done as far as making sure that when we have new taxes coming up, there has to be hearings on it, there must be studies to see how it's going to affect Massachusetts. Yes, ma'am. Okay, um, I'm sure we all hear Okay. Is to get 
opportunity to try and change the law anywhere else in the process because they know that will be fatal. It's not like Congress where there's committee meetings and they're debating amendments, they just you know decide what they want to write in the back of the napkin and so they go home. And, and, and to that one point, when we were debating uh, every every year at the beginning of the well, every two years at the beginning of our term, the first vote we take is on the rules debate. And that's where a lot of these uh, these changing of the House rules, these a lot of these sunshine, uh, open up uh, open meetings, you know, all these people are talking about. That's really the heart of when uh, we get a chance to debate. One of the I'll never forget this one. I actually laughed out loud at the but I actually turned around and looked at people who laughed at the guy. They actually got up there and said the reason why we can't put a lot of this stuff up, there was not an amendment to put uh, certain committee votes and, um, uh, and, and some, some video and a lot of things online for the public to view. And the reason why they said they couldn't do it was because we did not have the IT infrastructure available to us to uh, that's the absurdity of it. It's clearly not true. And it's insane that that would actually be said as a reason why we can't give the public the opportunity for them in just you know today's world in 2013, the ability to view what's going up on with you know how their taxpayer dollars are being spent up there. And it was all because we don't have the technology to do it in the state house. When you go in every meeting room, you go everywhere, the cameras everywhere, you can flip a switch like that and get you the computers from cameras, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm Claire from Paul's MA Smart Meters, and we have a bill, um, H2926. Um, and so I lobbied the Telecommunications Committee with another member of our group. <laughs> and it was clear that the only people we need to lobby are the chairs because. Whatever they I asked, you know, this is my first foray into this. I'm like, are you kidding? You know, you don't think independently and look independently? No. All we need is to convince the chair, and uh, that and that's where it will go. I'm sure. It goes back to the absolute oh, one sided right. power. Right. And taking it out and you just roll up to the speaker. And, and the reality is, and that gave you that 54 number. I mean, we're not even we're not even at that ability to if something was to get vetoed. And they have such a super majority that literally a handful of people run the entire state. And that's why we need to change. And that's why 2014 has to be an incredibly successful uh, election for Republicans in the legislature. And can I take one comment to your statement? Yeah. I agree with you. You're, you were very perceptive in picking up on that. Oh, okay. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> However, going back to Rob's point, the, one of the reasons for the, the overturn of the tech tax was the outside pressure of the individual. So if, if a committee chair or the Senate president or the, or the, the, the um, speaker is hearing from every one of his members uh, or and every one of his committee chairs, the people, he's, he's, the people he listens to, yeah, my phone's ringing off the book. I can't, I, we need to do something about this. This is going to kill me. Uh, my, my district is not happy with this. That message, if that message is coming from every member to them, that may be internally one way to apply some pressure. So if you're actually trying to change something specifically within something or you know, working with the committee chairs, it's definitely, definitely the right move. And it's always the, you know, the first place to start. But that outside pressure, like in the tech tax, definitely can, can create a groundswell to overturn it. Good to the back, Corn. I think it's not something they want to see in the ballot. How's that? Um, you know, generally speaking, when, when tax bills hit the ballot and they're reasonable, and I say that as a, as a guy who who is all about tax cuts, I look at when we, I think it was two years ago or four years ago, we put on the ballot to reduce the income tax to 3% instead of just going to 5%. And when you go too far, the public won't go with you. It's a reasonable thing. Like 5%, I think we'd have won that year in a heartbeat. Something like this is extremely reasonable. It was the gas tax. Repeal the automatic increase. I call it the gas tax to infinity and beyond. I got to the floor. I tried to follow my kids' love. I was like, you have the toy story. And that was the tax nine years ago. And I think the public, that is something that is so egregious. And it's such, such a bad precedent that the legislature will not even vote year after year to raise your taxes. They're going to vote once, try to take the pain of it one time at the battle clock, and then let it forever increase. And the, the precedent is bad, and what's next? We're going to do that to your income tax? Your sales tax? And 
a new couldn't create jobs in the governor of Massachusetts. So now we're discovering he's running the welfare officer. So this group needs to think, we're going into the year 2014, where you don't have this type of opportunity very much. We saw during the Carter years, we saw when Reagan won, we're going to see it again in 2014. I encourage you guys, he said how you know how these guys win. They ran. We don't run in the state with two parties. conservative right-wing person that we can't afford conservative. 